Good morning and welcome to the Megacast. If you are not familiar with the Megacast, it's not just a radio show. It's not simply a television show. It's a podcast, but it's not just a podcast or a Facebook live stream. It's all of the above. We brought together all of these amazing media outlets all across Oakland County to bring you the latest COVID-19 information. We've been doing it for almost two months now. We're delighted to be with you again today. Good morning. Hello, I'm Dave Scott. Tyler Keefe will be here joining me in just a couple of minutes after he had some buttons. We're operating with the very least staff possible here in our studios so we can observe all the rules and regulations and social distancing. And if you're watching us on TV right now, we always start off the day with our Clorox disinfectant wipes here. We get one of those out, clean off our surfaces, use uh, the masks when we're walking around the studios and not able to keep the social distancing that we wish we could. We're doing all the things that we hope you are doing as you open, reopen your business in, uh, in our listening area. We really have our hands full. Big thanks to all of our media outlets today. That includes Civic Center TV, Channel 15 in the West Bloomfield, Orchard Lake, Kegel Harbor, and Sylvan Lake area. Thank you very much for tuning in there. Hello to everyone in the Birmingham and uh, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and Franklin area joining us today on Birmingham Area Municipal Television. If you want to watch online, you can do so at civiccentertv.com. Again, civiccentertv. Dot com. Feel free to go there. And then how about these three great radio stations? 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, and WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Uh, between the three of them, just covering a big part of our county and our local service area. And boy, we got a, we got a busy day today here on the show. We're going to talk to our usual collection of amazing experts via Zoom. Uh, we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. School cuts. We see from the Detroit Free Press today that school cuts may be more significant here in the state of Michigan than we earlier anticipated. Uh, one state senator who we'll talk to in the next couple of days say those cuts could be as deep as two thousand dollars a student that is tyler i think that uh, that gets to be about 25 percent of the school funding and if that's the shape that we're going to be in we we got our we got our hands full as we uh, as the educators head into the fall and try to figure out how to make it all work in a more complex time with with less money uh, of course, there continues to be news on these stories. That, that Can we take guns in the state capitol? Uh, some development on that. Uh, governor spoke out yesterday during a press conference about uh, the protests that are anticipated this week. Said, would, you, would you wear your masks? Keep social distancing at least. Um, and, uh, and then here's a really good news from at least our backyard here in Oakland County. Over the past 24 hours, we had, Tyler, this is great. 16 new cases. That's it? Wow. 16 That's new great. cases only in Oakland County. And now we're still lose. Every person we lose is a tragedy, and we hate it to is. see it happen. But those numbers are also declining. That is uh, really good news. And where we can get it. We are certainly appreciative of the help that's coming from uh, businesses and, and from neighbors and, and from the federal government as well. And uh, good news in our neighborhood, not in Oakland County, but affecting uh, all of Metro Detroit and certainly uh, Wayne County in Detroit, is uh, money coming to the Detroit Housing Commission. And we are really delighted to be joined by Sandra Henriquez right now via Zoom. She's the executive director of the Detroit Housing Commission, joining us via, uh, via Zoom, uh, Ms. Henriquez. Hello, welcome to the Megacast. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Well, thank you for joining us today. You know, we're just one big community, all of this thing together, trying to figure out what's going on. And, and uh, you know, housing is an issue everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're in Oakland County, Wayne County, uh, up north. It's, uh, it's a big issue for all of us here in Michigan. Uh, what does, in normal times, what does the Detroit Housing Commission do? Well, in normal times and in these times, we house the most economically challenged uh, families and seniors. Um, in our community. Um, our housing is uh, income-based. The rent is based on your income, and so as your rent, uh, your income increases, your rent goes up. But if you're in a time like this, when you're losing jobs and other benefits are cut, uh, we're able to then readjust your rent, and your rent can go down. 
So it's still always affordable housing in the long term. You know, just think, uh, thank you for your great work. Think of the people that would be on the streets of the city of Detroit and Wayne County uh, had uh, your services not been there. How, you, you must be just helping a ton of people uh, have a roof over their head in, in our area. Yeah, we're trying. Um, the, the Detroit Housing Commission is the largest in Michigan, although there are lots and lots of other housing commissions across Michigan who are doing the same sorts of good work. And so I think uh, while we get to be the largest, we're not the only ones doing this, this kind of work, community after community across the state. So well, we're probably housing about 4 or 5% of the city of Detroit's population, um, about 3,600 public housing units, and then we've got about 5,000 to 5,500 Section 8 vouchers as well. Sandra Henriquez is joining us, the executive director of the Detroit Housing Commission. Are there housing commissions in, in municipalities around the state? Are they, are they serving counties, or how, how does that generally work? We have a little of both. Um, in, and it varies from state to state, but generally every uh, city and or town in Michigan or across the nation that has applied for public housing, uh, public housing grant years and years ago when the program first started, um, is able to set up um, a commission or a housing authority in its jurisdiction. Um, and then each state generally has a state housing finance agency. In this case, it's the Michigan State Development Authority, uh, MISHDA, and they too, while they finance permanent housing and multifamily housing, uh, issue tax credits for the building of affordable housing, they also have the largest um, state housing choice voucher or Section 8 program in Michigan at about 28,000 units. So good news for you. That's what we have you here to talk about today. U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, otherwise known as HUD, recently distributed nearly $11 million for public housing programs here in Michigan. Uh, I know you probably could have used more, but does that money help, and where is that money going? Um, that money always helps. Um, so $11 million came to Michigan. Uh, Detroit got about $2.4 million of that. We do expect over time that there may be even more money coming to uh, local housing commissions, and that is to supplement the operations that we currently um, do, and it's also to provide additional money for COVID-19 related expenses. And so every housing authority has stepped up its cleaning protocols, particularly in its high-touch areas, making sure that um, those surfaces are disinfected. Um, we've uh, been building and will build as we continue to look toward opening up more of our business um, and having more interaction directly with our constituents and our, our customers, um, building, retrofitting our offices, for example, and so that we can maintain the social distancing. It allows us to buy the kinds of uh, uh, computers or technology or other instruments that we need in order to, to do this new normal, is what people, I guess, are going to call it, um, whether we need new technology so people can work remotely uh, more comfortably, whether we need to think about uh, do new business processes so that we can limit the kind of one-to-one -one interaction um, um, so that we can still carry on business, people can pay their rent, people can have their rent adjusted, people can have their units inspected, we can do all our normal business that we have to do and comply with state and federal guidelines in running our housing. But how do we do that in a way that is 21st century, new technology, new processes? And so this is maybe in some ways um, a silver lining because it gets us to, re, um, to look at how we do our operations and how to do them better. Well, you know, I appreciate you saying that. Sandra Henriquez is joining us here, Executive Director of the Detroit Housing Commission. I appreciate you saying that, uh, Sandra, because that's really the theme across uh, almost everyone we talk to, across all sectors, public sector, private sector, people uh, living in their own home. We all have to pivot. We all have to adjust, figure out what that new normal is and, and operate in a different way. And, yeah, it's been painful. But, you know, along the way, we're learning some things, too. So that's that's the good news. The Detroit Housing Commission, are you helping, in addition to, um, I'm sure, uh, having facilities, uh, do you help people that are behind in their rent and um, help them um, with their funding for rent if they can't afford it in programs like that? No, we, are, we do not. Um, we're, we're, 
regulatory and statutory environment we work under on the federal level in particular, um, we do services and provide those kinds of services for residents and applicants who are participants in our housing choice voucher program or our public housing okay. rental assistance program. Um, people who need other assistance who are in private housing that is not subsidized probably need to look to their local governments to use other federal funds for those kinds of programs, both at the state and the city municipal level. We, we obviously know that the problem with COVID-19 is particularly acute in communities of color. It's been very well documented. Uh, it, is housing a component of, of that people that uh, may not have the housing they need? And, you know, for those of us that get to go home to a, a meal and, and, a, and a dry, safe place every night, um, it, it, you know, we're in a different place. Is housing, is the housing component part of this whole problem? Uh, the lack of affordable housing is a problem whether we're in a pandemic or not. Um, decade, at least a decade or more ago, there was definitely a connection made between housing and health. Um, so you'll see some housing first models for homeless populations getting people into shelter um, and so that they can stabilize themselves and their health situations and the savings that accrue both to the um, emergency room hospital uh, networks, as well as just in terms of people's own health and morbidity and how they improve once their housing has been stabilized. Um, here, during a pandemic, it's uh, incredibly important that people have individual apartments so people need to uh, quarantine because they've been exposed or that they've been tested positive and they can isolate. Having your own apartment that you can go into, close the door, um, and get services delivered to you for food, medication, those kinds of things without having to expose other people is really important. And you'll see that I think over time, as more and more people get their housing stabilized and the healthcare system is able to respond, I think we'll find that people through all of these mechanisms of social distancing, of having um, decent, safe, affordable housing in which to live, will go a long way in um, having people um, stay as safe as possible and to decrease the spread of the, the virus. Well, I, you know, I appreciate coming on the show today, Sandra Henriquez, Executive Director of the Detroit Housing Commission. You know, there's a lot of us that are complaining and whining and crying about, uh, you know, not wanting to stay at home. And it, it's just good to take a couple of minutes and think about the stay-at-home order and then just imagine for a moment you're living in the stay-at-home order and you don't have a home, right? So you're just naturally going to be more exposed. I know you're doing a great job. I, I have the pleasure of working with some organizations that also help my, my good friend Mitch Album. It's just so great to work on his charities because, you know, he's helping, getting people in houses. Maybe it's only a couple of families every year, but every little bit helps. It's a whole community all coming together and working on things. Uh, is there anything else that we could do to help or anything else that uh, – that we should know about as we, we try to do as individuals anything we can to help folks that don't have some place to go home to at night? I think, yes, I think there are a couple of things I'd like to leave you with. One is that um, as we've had stay at home orders, there are people, not just the doctors and the nurses and bus drivers and grocers who are on the front lines, but at public housing authorities and housing commissions across Michigan and across the nation we've been deemed as critical infrastructure workers as well. I have men and women who are out uh, every day at housing developments and doing property management, but working to keep themselves safe, but more importantly, to keep our residents safe. And so they've gone to work every single day during this crisis, leaving their own families and, at, at home um, and coming to work in service of others. And I think that they too need to be commended um, as much as anybody else who's been able to work every day through this uh, crisis that we're in. Number two, I would say that the more people understand the connection between housing and health, the better off we'll be, and that the, the issues about affordability and demand and the creation of more housing will go a long way, not just now during this pandemic, but will go a long way for 
decades and decades and future generations to come if we can appropriately house people um, at a price point that they can afford so that they can then build um, the rest of their lives and get into the world of work or get a promotion or get better education for themselves and for their children. And so it's not just a, this is only for poor people program, it, this is for all people because we will then lift all the votes. And the third thing I'd like to say, I think, in closing would be that as we come through this, it is important for people to understand that housing is also an economic generator, um, particularly um, in our um, housing choice voucher, formerly known as the Section 8 program. We have private landlords who um, have their homes. Um, they rent them out to voucher holders. That enables them to pay mortgages and property taxes, which keep city and state governments going. And so it's a, a very symbiotic process here that's in place. And, and people should not forget the importance of those housing subsidies and the larger role they ultimately play in, the, in government across this nation. Well, Sandra, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Sandra Henriquez, Executive Director of the Detroit Housing Commission, and uh, giving us some insight into uh, where some of this $11 million that's coming to the state of Michigan from the federal government, uh, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, is being spent and some of the good work going on. Sandra, thank you very much. Let's keep in touch. And uh, any message that needs to get out to the uh, metro Detroit area, or at least our little slice of it, uh, we uh, we welcome your visit. Thank you, and I thank you for having me today. Sandra, Stay safe. Stay healthy, everybody. You too. Stay safe. Sandra Henriquez joining us from the uh, Detroit Housing Commission. She's got a big job, executive director, uh, making sure that many people in Detroit have a roof over their head. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us. Uh, joining us now in the studio is Eric Jones. Eric, pull a microphone up there and uh, say hello. You're keeping your social distance, I hope. Yes, Good you morning. are. morning. Yes, of course I am, always. So, so Eric got all geared up. You're ready. You got your gloves. You got your, uh, your mask. You got all the stuff, and you're ready. I think we're finally ready. To send you out to the community at large. Yeah, today's the big day. I'm looking forward to it. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to send you right down the road to uh, one of our grocery stores and, and just kind of see how it's going out there. People wearing their masks, how they doing, how they coping. Um, you know, I, I just just go out and talk to people and uh, share stories. And we'll, it'll be interesting to see what people have to say. And it's a beautiful yeah. day, so oh, why not, right? Out. I'm looking forward to see if people are willing to talk to me. That'll be <laughs> the first challenge. Well, you know, the hardest thing going into a, like a chain grocery store is not getting kicked out because we're a media entity. But, you know, that's okay. We're just going to go there. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And, um uh, and 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 uh and and talk to some folks all right for sure yeah all right, all well, right i'll check in with you guys soon all right it is erica jones she will be our person on the street here over the next uh, couple of days and weeks and uh, throughout the summer to help us get a better understanding of uh of this story. In a moment, we're going to check in with our good friend, the athletic director at West Bloomfield High School, Eric Pierce, who, uh, like me, has not been able to get a haircut for an awful long time. And, uh, you know, you'll see in a minute, he's actually, let's put him up on the screen real quick. You're looking good. My goodness. So we'll get back to him in just a couple of minutes. This is the MegaCast. Dave and Tyler, we'll be right back. Virus is deadly, but Michigan can fight back. Our front doors are the front lines of defense. Staying home is the best way to stop the spread because just one infected person can give it to 40, who can give it to countless more. So call grandma, don't visit, video chat, don't meet up. And if you must go out for food or medicine, keep at least six feet from others. Stay home, stay safe, stop the spread. Technology, like smartphones, are wonderful devices to reduce social isolation in older adults. You can call grandchildren, phone friends, participate in fitness classes, and play games. But you need to stay mindful of scams. Scams related to the COVID-19 virus are rising. These include attempts to obtain personal information from seniors, including pitching unreliable products, advice, tests, and cures. You need to stay vigilant and be cautious. If you feel that you have been taken advantage of, it's okay for you to reach out 
to somebody you know and seek out advice or even contact your medical provider. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. It's the Megacast on some amazing radio stations around our area. 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, the Biff in the Bloomfield Hills area. And uh, I hate them. You know why my mic flag is falling off my microphone? It's because it's so clean. All right, let me get that set back up again for television. There you go. All right. <laughs> 88.1 WBFH, the Biff. Did I say that? I think I did. 89.5 WAHS Avondale Community Radio. Bama, Birmingham Area Municipal uh, Access. That's Birmingham, Bingham Farms, Beverly Hills, and uh, Franklin. We're on TV there. We're on TV on Civic Center TV, Channel 15. You can watch us in Channel 99 and AT&T all across Metro Detroit. Go to the municipal channels. You'll find us there. And then, of course, go to Civic Center TV com and hit the uh, hit the video player we'll be there as well for you and today facebook we're on one of the west bloomfield facebook channels today right yeah we're on the west bloomfield fire department facebook. on the fire department so there are literally thousands of followers i mean who doesn't love a fireman so they got all kinds of followers right. on their facebook page right so uh, go there and you can watch us as well uh patiently waiting through all this is our good friend the athletic director at west Bloomfield high school eric pierce looking good mr pierce there on uh, zoom <laughs> i tell you it's uh it's been a, a real drag not being able to get a haircut or I, I i decided i'll just let the beard grow until i can figure that one out <laughs> well you look good see you now your hair looks like it's normal your haircut would be normal for me at this point but you keep your your do a little bit tighter now mine is totally out of control the only reason it doesn't look so bad right now is that uh is that I got a lot of I don't like got a lot of grease going up there right now, so uh, <laughs> and we're making that happen, it, you know. But I'm not, I am not getting my hair cut. I mean, I could go up to Owasso to the barber up there, but we're just gonna wait. We'll wait it out, and then we're gonna have a big. I think we should just have like a mass haircut day when this whole thing is all over. Should be a lot of fun. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> How's Eric Pierce doing? You you are I clearly you're at home. Everything okay with you and your family and at, at your domicile? Yes, everything's going going well. Uh, you know, we've got the homeschooling going on right now. My wife's actually on with her class. She's an elementary school teacher, so uh, she's on a Zoom with her class right now. And my all three of my kids are are working away with their their schedule for the day. So uh, an awful lot to talk about, and I appreciate you taking time to join us. It wasn't too long ago, I think maybe a week, week and a half ago, uh, John Johnson from the Michigan High School Athletic Association was kind enough to come on the show. We chatted a little bit about what might be happening. Uh, unless something is developed in the last week or so, I think the biggest issue is, as it is in almost every sport, uh, high school, college, professional, just still a lot of uncertainty right now. Is that, is that where we're at? That is 100% where we're at right now. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying not to get too far ahead. We're trying not to make too many predictions with everything. Uh, it's, it's basically just a wait and see. Um, and that's probably the most frustrating thing with everything is that people keep asking questions. And, you know, I, I understand their concern. And a lot of times we don't have the exact answer to the question. We can provide certain scenarios, but we can't provide the exact answer because, quite frankly, we don't know exactly what's going to be happening. Your uh, your good friend and mine, I quote literally every day, frequently every day of the show to the point where my staff is getting tired of me going down this uh, this line here. But uh, uh, Pat Watson, none other than Pat Watson on this show about a week, well, about a month ago, actually, yes. said, yeah. Dave, you know, he's so smart. He yeah. just says oh, these yeah. one sentence things. Yeah. He said, Dave, hope is not a plan. He said, hope is not a plan, and that's really good. We use that every day, and that's the good case stuff. right now. So I imagine you hope that you'll have high school football and the other fall sports, but uh, are you working on alternative plans? Yeah, and, and you know, right now we are very hopeful. Um, and uh, as we go through this with the stay-at-home order and we're seeing the numbers dropping, declining, uh, everything leveling off, um, we are very hopeful that our summer activities will continue to go on as planned. And we're hopeful that we're able to run a fall program as planned. Um, all the schedules are in place right now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, a, once again, a wait and see. Um, I, I have coaches that are asking me every single day, when do you think we'll be able to 
start resuming our off-season conditioning? Uh, when do you think we'll be able to start seeing our players again? And um, unfortunately, it's not until the stay-at-home order is lifted, uh, and, and we just have to wait for that to occur. So keep our fingers crossed, and uh, you know maybe at the end of May, that seems to be another benchmark date on May 28th when that order comes up for review, unless something happens to change between now and then. Can uh, students that are athletes in in, uh, in athletic programs, can they do anything? Can they work out on their own? Can their coaches give them some training programs they can work on on their own, or are they just re-idled? Yeah, and, and, and that's one of the biggest things. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's always that cliche we use in coaching, what do you do when nobody's watching you? Um, and uh, those people that want to get better are going to be working on their own right now. Um, unfortunately, our facilities at West Bloomfield are closed. We're doing that for the health and safety of everybody. Um, but at home, we can have our student athletes participating in workouts. I, you know, if they have weights at home, they can be doing calisthenics, they can be, uh, you know, going through their route progressions in football. Uh, they can be working on stick handling for field hockey. They can do a lot of different things. Um, and the best thing that the student athletes at home can do is reach out to their coaches and their coaches will provide them with certain activities, drills that they can do every single day. Uh, for instance, my son plays travel baseball and his coach sends a video to us twice a week and it shows different drills that he wants them working on throughout the week. Obviously we can't practice right now. so. Um, that drill work helps out and helps keep the kids, keeps them sharp so that they can keep on honing their skills um, in this time. Eric Pierce is with us. He's the athletic director at West Bloomfield High School, and he joins us here in the MegaCast. Good to, good to be with you today, Eric, and thank you for taking time. So um, are you talking to the other athletic directors around the state of Michigan, having conversations, and are you, like, working on some kind of contingencies? Is there... A, you know, I almost hate to ask what they might be, but uh, I'll let you weigh in before I take you down that path. Yeah, so um, we've been in constant communication. Uh, we actually have another meeting with uh, the OAA, which is the league that we're in, the conference that we're in. The athletic directors are meeting this Thursday again through Zoom. Um, but, you know, we've been, we've been hopeful throughout this whole process. When the stay-at-home order first came out uh, in March, um, we actually met and we made sure that we came up with contingency plan to see if we could have an abbreviated season for the spring. Obviously that didn't happen. Um, but throughout this whole process, we've been working and, and, and trying to adjust, adapt as, we poss as well as we possibly can so that we can provide those, um, those athletic opportunities to our students as much as we possibly can. Uh, right now in terms of contingency plans, I, I mean, I think we're going to have to use the NCAA as a guide. We'll have to use the MHSA and their recommendations as a guide. Um, there might be some, some obviously issues with a number of fans attending certain events uh, that could be limited. It might not be at all, um, but we're going to, we're going to play ball, so to speak with all the rules and regulations out there to make sure that everybody is, is safe and that they feel comfortable participating in athletics. So just football is an example. It's the most visible sport. It, it's, it's possible that you would, if, if you could, and the only way you could play your football season, the, at the OAA coaches and the ADs, the only way they could play their season uh, here in our area would be to do it without fans. You guys would do that? I would do whatever is possible to make sure that our students have the same athletic opportunities that they've always had. All right. Um, and, and, you know, I would be, I would be a big proponent of it. Uh, as you know, in, in, in all our sports, we've had a lot of success with students moving on to the next level and participating in athletics at, at the collegiate level, at the intercollegiate level. Um, I don't want to put a strain or hamper anybody's chances of, of going on and achieving their future goals um, by not having a season for them. Now, obviously, there, there would be some, some cautions that are taking place that we have to make sure that everybody's safe, that the, the, the health of everybody is, is up, it's the, at the foremost for everything. Yeah, and, that, um, and Eric, so. that gets more complicated when you talk about a sport like uh, football or basketball. I mean, look at the trouble the NBA ran into. Maybe a little easier to social distance in golf or baseball or some right. of the track and field. And but, yeah. but, you know, your football, I mean, what do you, what do you envision? I mean, just we're – way hypothetical but you test students before a game yeah what kind of things are you talking about I, i'd imagine there'd be some some protocols in place like that um you know more and more you see everybody at positions in in, in football wearing gloves anyways 
Um, so you would think that that might be a case in, in, in certain things here where, where everybody might be re required to wear the gloves. Um, they might be required to wear some type of face mask or, you know, obviously a lot of them were wearing shields on their, on their helmets as well. Um, so, you know, as, as soon as the MHSAA comes down with any types of rules or regulations, we'll make sure that we adhere to them. To the to the T. All right, you you're working on an esports program at West Bloomfield Schools, or do you already have one? I mean, they have one at Oakland University. We talked to the coach. Pretty amazing what's going on in that space. No, it it, it is crazy what's going on with esports, and that's another uh, another route that the MHSA is definitely talking about. Um, and and as those opportunities become available, you know, we're we're open to to anything that provides great opportunities for our students at right. West. Bloomfield. Eric, I, I talked to the other Eric the other day, um, your principal, Eric Pace, at uh, West Bloomfield, and I talked to folks in Walled Lake, and I talked to folks at some of the private schools and some of the other school districts, and everyone's just like scratching their head trying to figure out how to do graduation. And I know you're working on that, they're working on that. I've heard, <laughs> we've heard some pretty uh, creative approaches for graduations, um, but I know you guys are working on that. I know you're, you're going to come up with something special. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's one of the big things that's that's involved in this is, is you know, we're absolutely heartbroken, especially for our seniors. Um, you know, our senior athletes, I mean, this was their last hurrah, their last dance, you know, to, to take the line from ESPN right now with the Michael Jordan documentary. Um, and we had a lot of momentum with a lot of our spring sports. And I was really excited to see how they would develop throughout the year. Um, you know, a, a lot of returning defending league champs, uh, some teams that made it pretty far in the playoffs last year. Um, it, it's important for us that we still go through and we honor our seniors the way that we normally would have done. Obviously, they don't have a senior night like they would have. Um, but if you go to our athletic website, westbloomfieldathletics.com, we have the spring sports senior spotlight where we have our seniors that are posting videos of themselves, letting us know what their plans are for next year, what their most memorable moment are or was in their sport. Um, we're just trying to honor them as well as we possibly can. It even goes down to something as as a lot of people don't even think about it, but the, the scholar athlete breakfast, um, you know, we want to make sure that we honor still the 120 athletes that we have at West Bloomfield High School that are seniors that still had a 3.0 or higher GPA throughout the course of their four years at the school. And 44 of them are going to graduate with a, a grade point above a 4.0. That's fantastic. It's amazing. And we want to make sure that we're still honoring those students. All right, just make sure Eric and Eric know that Dave and Tyler are here to do whatever we can do. So uh, good to see you. Uh, love the haircut. Uh, get, just keep in touch, and it's a crazy time ahead of us. Best wishes to everyone at your school district. One final thing, one little piece of tough news. It just came out today. Uh, you know, you may be dealing with a tough budget condition next year, too, which might also complicate sports. I got a news story here today that said that the budget cuts could be deeper at schools. It's speculation but one senator says the number could be like a cut up to maybe two thousand dollars per student which would be be devastating you think that's going to spill over to sports i mean it unfortunately sports are, and music programs and other things are one of the first things usually to get cut right and um you know thank thank goodness we have a, a central office and, and a community that's dedicated to providing the opportunities um the extracurricular opportunities that we are in West Bloomfield. Uh, there's no doubt that there will be an effect on it, um, but but hopefully we can still provide all the same opportunities. That we have. All right, we're keeping our fingers crossed. Hope is not a plan, Eric Pierce. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you again. <laughs> all right, thanks so much, Dave. Thanks, Tyler. All righty, take okay. care. We're going to take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. This is the Megacast, and uh, it returns on 89.3 Lakes FM, WBFH, the BIF 88.1, WAHS at Avondale High School, 89.5, and on Civic Center TV in Bama, Birmingham Area Municipal Access. Back in just a moment. Hi, I'm Oakland County Executive Dave Coulter. Our top priority remains slowing the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Please stay home. And when you must go out to an essential business, take precautions like social distancing and washing your hands when you come home. Because of the pandemic, we are behind in our response rate in Michigan. While you are home, please take a few minutes to fill out the census. It is more important than ever that we receive money back from our federal government. The census is Oakland together. 
I know you're concerned about the coronavirus and we're working hard to combat its spread and keep your family safe, but we need your help too. Wash your hands often with soap for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your face and cough into your sleeve. Replace handshakes with an elbow bump. Avoid large crowds or events, and if you're sick, stay home and call your health provider. Every one of us can make a difference limiting the virus's spread and keeping Michigan healthy. And the governor added yesterday during her press conference, if you're coming, <laughs> if you're coming to Lansing for any reason, protest or otherwise, put a mask on too. You know, it seems reasonable. It seems like a reasonable thing. Pretty, yeah, yeah, pretty seems like we'll, play her, we'll play her very direct commentary. She seemed a little upset yesterday when she mentioned that. Uh, we'll play that for you coming up a little bit later in the Megacast. Uh, you got to keep a smile. You got to keep a smile going during these challenging times. Hey, Dave Scott, Tyler Keefe over there, keeping our social distancing, making sure that we are following each and every gubernatorial order so we do not get in trouble. Uh, but if we screw up, we know there are plenty of people to help and uh, try to keep us on the straight and narrow right now. And also uh, there to help if some gets confused is, is uh, Patrice Aaron. She's an attorney partner at the Jaffe Law Firm. And uh, Ms. Aaron, thank you very much for joining us here on the Megacast. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, good to have you there. Uh, you know, we, we it's so so much fun, just before we get into the business of the show, so much fun to do these Zoom calls and see everybody at their house. And, and uh, you know, so thank you very much for inviting us into your home for a couple of minutes today. As every, we always ask, is everyone doing okay at your place? And, and how is isolation going for, for you and your family? Every, everyone is doing fine in my family. Thank you for asking. Uh, isolation is a challenge as it is for most people, but uh, we're hanging in there and doing the best that we can under the circumstances. Everybody's happy and healthy, and that's all we can ask for. So I, I can count uh, my daily Zoom meetings on both hands barely. You've been doing a lot of that kind of thing to keep in touch like the rest of us have? Yes, Zoom meetings are becoming very popular, that and, and Google Meets as a as a way of getting together and, and conducting business. Uh, also, uh, education, or my kids are doing that um, uh, Google meetings for uh, teaching sessions with their with their teachers. And as it's well. been, it, and I know it's not what we're here to talk about today, but it's been absolutely amazing what has been happening in uh, in education. On the business side, we are. Uh, we're opening up our offices more and more, manufacturing beginning to open up. We saw a little a bit of an opening uh, in the last couple of weeks. Retail doing uh, a little bit more curbside service. And, you know, we've got a lot of different sectors of the economy that are coming back. We're, we still want to get more out, but uh, there are more companies, uh, and in particular manufacturers, opening their doors this week. Um there's an there's a lot there's a lot to consider as you open your doors. I I worked on like a long list from the county's website as we got ready to let more people in our studios, and it was confusing. It took several hours to try to figure it out. What kind of advice do you have for folks that are getting ready to reopen their businesses? Well, the first thing that you should do is make sure that you understand what your obligations are. Make sure that you've read the executive order. Uh, orders that have been issued by the governor. You should also understand whether there are requirements in the county in which you do business. Uh, different counties also have emergency health orders that have been issued and you should understand what those requirements are. And being familiar with what the recommendations of the CDC and OSHA have um, put out as well are important in order to uh, move forward. And it's important we get it right, not only so we don't run afoul of the law, but it's also important we get it right to uh, make sure our employees are comfortable and, uh, and and we put them in a safe environment. And then there's the employee side of it, too. I mean, your your employer may not get everything right, but I think it's important for employees to know, too, uh, what kind of things their employer should be doing so they can help the whole process along. Would you agree? Oh, I definitely agree. Um, employers need to understand what they're supposed to be providing to the employees. And likewise, employees should know what their employers should be providing to them. 
Patrice Aaron is on the line, attorney and uh, partner at the Jaffe Law Firm. We appreciate you joining us. So let's say we have an employee and they're collecting their unemployment. They're getting that extra $600 from the federal government. And you know what? They're kind of enjoying life on the beach. And we, employer, say, hey, it's time to get back to work. We're opening up our offices. We can do it under, given our business under the current orders. And employee A isn't really crazy about coming back to work. How do you resolve that one? Well, I think the first step anytime you're dealing with an employee who's reticent about coming back to work is really to understand the reason why they don't want to come back to work. And there could be a number of different reasons. One, as um, you point out, perhaps the employee is enjoying unemployment and doesn't want to come back to work. Uh, Or is there uh, a fear factor that you have to deal with employees fearful for coming back to work or are there medical reasons or one of the, are they taking care of um, a a loved one or are they dealing with children at home who uh, are not able to go to daycare or to school? So the first step is to understand the reason. But if the reason is that the employee simply would rather collect an unemployment check, then that's not a sufficient reason not to return to work. I think it's important important for employers to let their employees know that they have work available for them to do, to do that employee is welcomed back, uh, getting employees to be comfortable from a safety perspective that, uh, that their the employer has done what they're required to do to make the workplace safe and to welcome them back to work. And if the employee chooses Uh, despite that information not to return to work, unfortunately, it could jeopardize their unemployment benefits and their unemployment benefits would stop. All right, so let's do a short list. We only have a limited amount of time, unfortunately. Short list of reasons why employees um, wouldn't wouldn't, wouldn't have to come back to work. And I think you got to it. Uh, daycare may be an issue. Uh, maybe they have a health issue, too. I mean, could you could they theoretically an employee go to their doctor if they feel that they, um, you know, are in a high risk area? Might that be a reason why they wouldn't uh, want to go back to work and could could make those arrangements? Yeah, if you have a, a health condition that doesn't allow you to come back to work, the prudent thing for the employee to do would be to go to their doctor and to um, get a note uh, to to let the employer know that they should not be uh, in the workplace. Um, if you've got daycare or child care responsibilities, you have the Family First Coronavirus Response Act that provides uh, certain protections as well. And so there shouldn't be a blanket rule for employers um, requiring employees to come back to work no matter what. It's a, it's a case-by-case decision, and employers should be very careful and understand the reason why the employee's not coming But Patrice Aaron is with us, attorney partner, Jaffe Law Firm. Uh, we're talking about employment and labor issues as they relate to the coronavirus and your return. Our employers, is it their responsibility to interpret these orders? Um, you know, the governor can't write every little scenario into the orders. So, I mean, do, do we as employers, do we look at that and go, well, we kind of fall into this classification. We're, for example, a media outlet. So we feel that we are essential workers. Workers, and we've kind of deemed ourselves essential workers and are working under that set of conditions. Is that the responsibility of the employers to figure out how they fit in to these orders and comply with them as they see fit? Is that correct? Yes, the employer should do uh, a good faith effort at interpreting the executive orders. Um, there are cases where you can attempt to uh, discern the, the meaning by reading those executive orders quite carefully and in other emergency health care orders. But at the end of the day, the employer is obligated to interpret those the best that they can and, and to provide as safe a workplace as they can. And if they're confused, because my goodness, it's confusing. I had to go through it all myself. Uh, that's when, you know, we might want to call you, Patrice, or whoever our attorney is and, and just get some clarity. Probably not a bad idea right now. That's always a good idea to, to have someone 
uh, help you through this process. There's a lot of information and it can be confusing to try to understand and put it all together. All right. So here we've had a perfectly wonderful, enjoyable interview, and I'm about to screw the whole thing up. So let's talk about that guy up in Owasso real quick. I don't know if you want to render a legal opinion on that, but here we have a barber up in Owasso, obviously making huge headlines all around the state of Michigan. He refuses to close. The local sheriff has said, you know what, we're not going to enforce these regulations from the state because we don't want to. Court now has an injunction stopping the state from booting him. Uh, I think that the state is talking about possibly taking away their license. I assume you've been watching the news. What a crazy mess this is. Do you have any comment or thoughts on all of it? Well, um, my comment is to watch how it plays out in the court system. Um, unfortunately, when the, when the governor issues an executive order and then the counties have emergency health orders, there's a certain amount of teeth to them and, and they can be enforced through the judicial system, through the court system. And we have to then look to the courts to enforce those orders or uh, the attorney general to, to uh, enforce those orders through the court system. And then the courts ultimately have to make the decision um, to uh, whether they're going to uh, require that they be followed. Well, you lawyers are having a lot of fun right now watching that case and then just the, this huge monumental case that's going to probably go all the way up to the Supreme Court here in the state of Michigan to figure out whether or not uh, the governor can continue to hand out these orders or whether the legislature will prevail. They've taken her to court saying you can't do this anymore. So I, I assume you and all the other lawyers around the state of Michigan are keeping an eye on these cases and we'll, 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 we'll as you said, probably wait and see with how the courts rule. But any thoughts on that one at all? Well, at this point, uh, we do have the executive orders that are in place and the recommendation is to follow those executive orders until someone tells you that you shouldn't. Uh, so at this point, the executive orders are in place. If the court system were to determine that the governor had overstepped, if those orders are not enforceable, that they can't be followed, then uh, we will be in a different situation and, and presumably the legislature will then have to act uh, and provide some guidance to employers in this issue. You know, just to affirm what you just said, even the folks that uh, sued her said, follow the orders for now. I mean, even, even those guys said, you know, look, for right now, you got to follow the governor's orders. We'll let this play out in court and we'll figure it all out. Counselor, I got to go. This is fun. Thank you very much. Hopefully we can have you back again. Uh, Patrice Aaron, attorney, partner, Jaffe Law Firm. Anything you want to say before we say so long? And well, stay safe and uh, stay healthy. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for all the helpful advice. It is a complicated time, my friends. Uh, here's a fun thing going on. A bunch of Blue Angels are going to be flying over Metro Detroit in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. You'll be able to look up. It's going to be tough here in Oakland County to see them, but uh, we're going to talk about their flight path and what it's like to be a Blue Angel and fly. We are going to check in with a good friend of mine. He is a uh, 20,000 hour plus pilot. Been flying over 27 years. He is a designated pilot examiner for the FAA. This guy knows more about flying than anybody I know. We're going to get to him in just a moment. This is the Mega Cast, and uh, we will talk Blue Angels when we return. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. I'm the Chief Medical Executive for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. The people who are at highest risk of getting severely ill from COVID-19 are the elderly and those with chronic medical conditions. That includes people with heart disease, diabetes, COPD, or those who have compromised immune systems. People who are in those categories should right now be staying at home as much as possible and not going out if it is not essential. If you fit into one of those categories, those are the things you should do. And if you have a family member who fits into one of those categories, you should be checking in on them and making sure they are following those guidelines. There's something everyone can do to protect the community from COVID-19. 
All right, welcome back. This is the Megacast. Dave Scott, Tyler Keith in our Lakes FM studios. And uh, all right, this is a fun segment for me. I just, I, I got, <laughs> I got to admit it because I love flying. It's one of the things that I do as a pilot. This guy loves flying even more than I do, though, and he is in our Zoom. He is my friend Lee Stanley. He is a designated pilot examiner with the FAA. He can uh, get guys like me their pilot's license. He can also, uh, you know, not give us our pilot's license. So he's my best friend. Uh, <laughs> he uh, helps examine people uh, all the way up to the guys that fly your big 747s. He's got over 20,000 hours in the air, been flying for 27 years, uh, was the chief pilot for Chrysler. Tyler, look at this flying resume. Lee, who's on camera right now, has flown Paul McCartney, Dire Straits, Whitney Houston, Jack Black, and Lee Iacocca. Lee Stanley, thank you very much for joining us in the Megacast. Good morning, Dave. How you doing, my friend? Oh, not bad for the year and the miles. How are you doing? I'm doing good. You got. The, I like the backdrop. See, everyone comes yeah. here uh, with a Zoom situation that is befitting who they are. You got the big clouds behind you, a, a towering cumulonimbus right behind you. I like that. So. Well, I was actually going to do this one. But oh, that's, that's but... yeah, it's a little better. You're on the beach. So, Lee, we've got uh, the Blue Angels coming to Detroit today. Uh, that's going to be fun. I mean, what a what a great opportunity to look up in the sky and see some of the mo most magnificent airplanes and really, you know, some of the most amazing pilots flying overhead today. Well, that's true. I, I don't really know much about them because my career was a civilian career. But uh, I did look up some things online because I knew you were going to ask me about them. So I thought I might as well try so, to look at least a little intelligent. No, but, no, no. Uh, I, pre to, I appreciate it. I have some it. interesting facts about them if you'd like to hear them. I would love to hear what it, some information about uh, the Blue Angels. Well, they were started in 1946 by Admiral Nimitz. And they were started first off as a recruiting device because they were trying to get people interested in the Navy. So they started off with Hellcats. <laughs> and and uh, they had a contest in Florida to name the Blue Angels, and they came up with the, you know, the the, the turbo blasters and the, the the wave runners, and actually one of the guys in the uh, first ex exhibition team <laughs> was at a nightclub called the Blue Angel Nightclub in New York City. <laughs> and he thought, hey, that's a pretty good name, and it subsequently oh, stuck. So, and they fly, the fastest they go is 700 miles an hour. Their ref speeds, which means essentially their approach to land speed is 120 uh, nautical miles an hour. Or we got to do what we talk about, like... So, it, I mean, that it's amazing, Lee, I just had to, uh, we're just making an adjustment. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but uh, we're trying to make some adjustments to some of the audio going on in your Zoom, and we're hearing some other folks, so we'll fix that real quick. But, uh, yeah, it's got to be amazing. I mean, uh, the uh, just the physical nature of flying around and um, pulling the G-forces that they must pull. I mean, the Blue Angels, we may not see it today as they're flying over Detroit, recognizing uh, all the workers here, the the frontline workers during the coronavirus. But, you know, when you go to a typical show like the Cherry Festival and you see those guys flying straight up, you know, a couple of miles straight up in the air, what kind of impact does that have on your on your body? What's that, to the extent that you know, what's that feel like? Well, they have, they, normally in combat aviation, they wear G-suits because they don't want the blood to, when you start pulling heavy Gs, the blood starts pooling in your feet and your extremities. And so they have G-suits that literally squeeze your body, they squeeze your chest, squeeze your legs in particular, because that's where a lot of it pools. And so it keeps the blood uh, flowing to your brain so you don't pass out. And uh, you can pull, you know, seven to eight to, I think nine Gs is about as much as a human can take. But the Blue Angels can't wear G-suits because their stick is right in the middle and their G-suit would be inflating and deflating so much that it would literally hamper the uh, maneuverability of the aircraft. So they have to literally clench their muscles when they fly in the air shows in order to be able to uh, handle the Gs that they're pulling in those maneuvers. That's amazing. I, did you take a look at the route? To me, it looks like they're going to be flying, uh, starting over the Ann Arbor area or just west of that, and then uh, then heading over uh, downtown and some other areas. Do you have any idea what the, the Blue Angel route will be uh, next hour yeah, here? I looked it up online. Uh, I, I'm out in the 
Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills area, they're not coming here. They're going to go over Ann Arbor and then down to Ypsilanti. And then uh, I think it's Deckerville. And then they're going to go down the river to the uh, downtown area. And then they're going to fly up, uh, looks like maybe Gratiot or Mound out to um, Sterling Heights, Macomb County, back down, make a right turn, back down over the Gross Points, the river, and then out to the west. All right. Well, we're not going to see them probably over Oakland County. These guys got to learn that Woodward and the Dream Cruise is, is really what it's all about. They should have been coming right up Woodward. Right. So if we're standing in like a really clear area and we don't have any trees around us, uh, do you think there's any possibility that folks in Oakland County would be able to see these guys? I mean, just wild speculation. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. They're, they're probably going to be around three to 5,000 feet and uh, if you got trees around at all, it'd probably pr- be pretty tough to see them. All right. I, who knows? I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what the altitude is that they're going to. Their flight for, is going to. At least for our WAHS AHS listeners, 89.5 Avondale Community Radio covers a lot of Macomb County. So you Macomb County people, you're going to have a pretty good chance of seeing them as they work their oh, yeah. way up over Lake St. Clair and Selfridge and all that. So. Well, listen, thanks for checking in. Fun to talk flying with you for a couple of minutes. So, I mean, you flew Paul McCartney, Dire Straits, Jack Black, Lee Iacocca. And who was like the craziest of all the people that you ever had back in the plane while you were driving around the country? Well, I don't know how much liability is involved in telling stories about <laughs> celebrities in the back of your aircraft. But uh, some of the stories you've heard about Bobby Brown and, and Whitney Houston are true they happened on board the aircraft uh jack black is every bit as crazy as he appears <laughs> in the movies he may be even a bit more so paul mccartney was was a gentleman he was just a very nice guy uh, we flew hugh jackman too and hugh jackman I, of, of everybody i ever flew that had any uh, notoriety at all hugh jackman was the nicest human being i think i ever met he was he was really a, 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 a genuinely friendly, apparently or seemingly sincere. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's good. Nice good. You know, it's amazing when you run into famous people. You know, some of them are really difficult, and then there are a lot of them that are the nicest people that you ever yeah. want to meet, and it's got to be hard for them because they run into so many people. Uh, on an unrelated note, I want to mention that uh, you are – also in a band called Windchill Factor that I've seen many, many times. And I love your band. You guys do classic rock. You play in a lot of clubs. Uh, mm-hmm. Got to be tough right now with all that closed down, right? I mean, uh, any thoughts about that? You know, I, I, it's a brave new world. I, I've never experienced anything like this. Uh, so I've been, I've been flying for 40 years and examiner for 26 and in the band for playing music for 55 and I have never seen anything like this. Mm. So I, I don't know. I don't know how, how willing people are going to be to go get back into bars and get into closed spaces. And I just don't know. Well, I, maybe I hope, I hope it's not the end. Uh, uh, maybe uh, I hope it's not the end too. I think I think people will come back, but there might. There's definitely we talk about it in every sector of the economy and in everything yeah. we do. There's going to be a new normal. I I love this picture of the room. You know, so you got one, two, three, four, five guitars right behind you over there, and oh, there's six as your acoustic. So uh, clearly, you you have a little time to jam right there at your house. <laughs> <laughs> I got plenty of time these days. Hey, I wanted to do a little shout out to. I'm doing a seaplane rating. All these years of flying, I never did a seaplane rating. I'm doing a seaplane rating next week at Michigan Seaplane on Pontiac Lake, just off of Pontiac Airport. And when I do that, Dave, that will make me a seaplane instructor. So we can do your seaplane rating. I, I've always wanted to be able to fly a seaplane. Be careful. Look out below. Make sure it's not a wavy day and watch out for water skiers, Lee Stanley. Thank you for joining us. I'll see you soon. I appreciate you taking time for us today. All right. Nice talking to you. All right. Yeah. And that guy, I'm telling you, man, Tyler, that guy knows flying, and he's a great one. He's a, that's a, their band, Windchill Factor. You get a chance to see them. Go check them out. Um, thanks again, Lee. 
89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake, 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills, WAHS Auburn Hills, our great radio stations now legally ID'd for the FCC. Don't forget from back to the FAA for a moment that uh, the Blue Angels are in town today. They're going to be flying over Metro Detroit. And I would say, even if you're in Oakland County, and definitely, Tyler, if you're in Macomb County, take a couple of minutes. The flights are going to begin a little bit after 11 o'clock. Why not just pop outside, see if you can see them, because it's going to be really cool. Yeah, if you have a chance to see them, if you're in an area where you can look up and you can see these planes fly over, I absolutely suggest that you do. Uh, I've seen them fly before when I was much younger, and it was really cool. So if you have a chance to do that right in your backyard, front yard, wherever it may be uh, in your home, you should definitely do it. All right, so let's just keep moving along. Uh, This is an Oakland County show. So, boy, this guy, he is like Mr. Oakland County. Let's say hello to Marty Nolenberg, co-owner of Sedona Tap House Restaurant and, of course, former state rep and state senator from the 41st District. A lot of people uh, know you, uh, Senator Nolenberg. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Megacast. Good to have you with us today. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. I, I appreciate uh, sharing my thoughts. Well, I appreciate you having us with us uh, and uh, just getting an update of what's going on with you and the many different things you're involved in. I always ask everybody when they first come on the show, how are things going you're in your office or your home? Everything okay with you? You know, it's a, it's a crazy world that we live in, and we're just trying to make the best of it. Um, we have two locations, one in Troy. Uh, we are providing curbside service there, and... You know, we're doing the best we can with that. Our second location um, is in Novi, and we're in 12 Oaks Mall, and because the mall is closed, you know, we're closed over there. So we're just trying to manage it, and we're waiting for the mall to reopen. We're waiting for the governor to allow us to provide sit-down full service. And, you know, right now for us, it's, it's kind of a waiting game, and, uh, we're doing the best we can with what we have. So the Marty, the Michigan, if you don't mind me calling you Marty, the Michigan uh, Restaurant Association uh, did something a little bit different than a lot of the other associations. Rather than waiting for the governor to tell the restaurant and and bar industry and uh, uh, exactly how to do things, they put together a set of plans and sent them off to the governor asking for restaurants to be opened up around the end of the month. Do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I, I think the concern that the association has is some of her executive orders have been inconsistent, you know, throughout this whole process. And, and you know, the hope, I think, I hope what the governor gets out of that push is that she's reasonable in allowing us to be able to open in a timely manner. I mean, I, I'll give you an example, and it's a little off topic, but, you know, I've been to Home Depot several times in the last few weeks, and I go in there with my mask, I got my gloves on and very careful. And, you know, when you, when you purchase your item, um, one of the things that bugs me is, you know, there's no hand sanitizers for you to wash your hands after you've, you know, uh, you know, played with the register. And, you know, as a restaurant owner, I take some offense to that because, you know, we have, we're going to have hand sanitizers throughout the restaurant. Um, we're going to be cleaning our tables, our chairs, bathrooms, anything that people touch constantly. And so we're going through all these processes to keep our place clean. I feel like, you know, some of these other establishments like Home Depot and some of these grocery stores, they don't provide, you know, the care and the safety that is required, yet we're going to be required to do it. And, and so my hope is that the governor is reasonable in terms of what we're allowed to do and not do. And to be able to open up at 25%, it's probably impossible to, to make to make it work. So it, if that is yeah. the, it, Marty Nolenberg, uh, co-owner of Sedona Tap House Restaurants here, a couple of them in our area, if that is the case, is that going to work for you and the other restaurants? If you can get open around the end of May, maybe early June, and to get your doors open, and, and even if you, you can, then you can have your carry out and you can only have 25% capacity, is that going to at least get you guys back on your feet, you and the other operators around the state of Michigan, uh, to at least uh, help out a little bit? It's going to be tough. I mean, it's going to be tough to make it at 25%. I mean, I, I'd, I'd rather see 50% or 75%, and I think we can provide 
you know, all the safety that's required of our guests and our employees at a greater capacity than 25%. And it's going to be a case by case situation. I mean, it's, we're going to have to evaluate it. And, um, you know, we have to be flexible in terms of what we need to provide. But for me right now, for us, you know, we need certainty. We want to know what the governor is going to expect from us so that we can provide, if, you, if we have to buy things, we have to start buying them now because it's not like they're going to be readily available. If, if, if she said you can open tomorrow and you have to do 20 things, we need that preparation to be able to provide and do those 20 things. So, you know, we've got legal battles going on all over the place, and I really try to stay out of the political stuff in this show. We're just trying to, you know, talk to our friends in the community and, and share information. And I, I, By the way, I really appreciate you coming on the program and, and chatting with us, but I, I can't have you here without asking you uh, what you think uh, about this lawsuit that the legislature has uh uh, has uh, brought up and and suggesting an, and, and, and suggesting that it's illegal that the governor's orders that are out there right now that, is that something that if you were uh, back in the Senate uh, that's something you would sign on with Marty Nolenberg? You know I think it, it certainly is a quagmire. There's, there's there's two different laws that the governor and the legislature are disputing. Um, but but that aside, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert in this. I think the the court will have to the judge will have to decide, you know, which which law is most relevant. Um, I, I am concerned though that the governor. It seems like, you know, she does want to partner with the legislature, and you know, she's making all of these executive orders without input of the legislative body who've been elected by, you know, people their constituents, and they had no say in the matter. I think initially. The legislature felt, okay, the governor, you know, she's got to act quickly. Um, and, and she, you know, they allowed her to do that. She had the authority to do that. But now that it's been two and a half months later, it seems like she's trying to, you know, uh, not include the legislature. And so that that's a concern that I have. And and it's unfortunate that, you know, they, there is this squabble. That's not helpful for anybody. And I guess I wear my business hat. You know, I just want to do the right thing for my employees, the right thing for my guests, and whatever that looks like, I just need to have that certainty so we can provide all the safety, you know, for my guests and my, my employees. And uh, I my get it. My biggest concern is what, what does that look like? I get it. Marty, Marty Nolenberg joining us. I get it. And it's a really tough deal. You know, it's tough because... You know, she's saying we don't want to take a chance. Uh, we want to make sure that we continue to keep everybody in the state of Michigan safe. And restaurant owners such as you are saying, hey, we could do this safely. Give us a chance. Let's see what happens. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to learn an awful lot about where we're going over the next couple of weeks now that manufacturing has been opened up. And we'll see how that goes. And and I think that's really, uh, given her the benefit of the doubt for a minute, I think that's really what, what she's counting on. Let's do it one step at a time, see how things go. And if the numbers stay solid, then we're just going to keep going down that road. So I, I know it's tough. And and, uh, you know, I, I feel really bad for you and the other restaurants because, you know, Marty, what, whether you like it or not, you guys, you know, you and the hair salons and the casinos and places where people are going to, you know, you're taking the brunt of this. And, and an argument could be made that, well, it's really not much different at what's going on in your places than is going on in retail and grocery stores. So, you know, I get that. It's, it, it's tough, though, isn't it? It, it is tough. And, and, and I... I... I'm glad I'm not in that position myself. And, and, um, you know, it, 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 um, I think she's trying to do the right thing, but, you know, unfortunately she had been inconsistent in some of her orders. And I think that's where she got into trouble. Um, and, and, and she's lost some, some of her credibility as a result of that. And, and, and so my hope is that, you know, she'll trust the restaurant industry. You know, we are already one of the safest places um, to do business, we're highly regulated both at the state and the county level, and 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 we will we go over uh, uh, over and above what we're required to do, and we will continue to do that, and and so hopefully the governor will recognize that, and um, 
I'm glad I'm not in her, in her shoes. Well, you know, I appreciate that because, you know, you clearly are on the other side of the aisle from the governor. And, and you know, I, I appreciate you you saying here on the show that you understand the challenges that, that she has. And I, I think anyone, if they're really being honest, regardless of what they feel about the decision she's made, have to understand that it it's an incredibly tough job to try to, you know, uh, do this and and tangle this whole situation, and now even harder to untangle it. So uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. Well, I got to go. On behalf of all hungry bad cooks, we hope that you guys get your restaurants open. I mean, the only thing good personally about, uh, and I feel bad to say this about this thing, is that I I've saved a lot of money over the past couple of months because I'm in a restaurant or a, an establishment almost every day because I'm the worst cook ever. So Marty Nolenberg, I cannot wait till. The Sedona Tap House restaurants in uh, Novi and, uh, and and in Troy are open. And uh, best of luck to you, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right. Marty Nolenberg joining us here today on the Mega Cast. You know, in that restaurant in Troy, Tyler, Troy is just like you think about, you know, uh, one area that has so many restaurants and so many really cool restaurants, like right out there at, all across Troy and down Big Beaver and then, you know, Ferndale and Royal Oak and Birmingham and Rochester and you know, all of our communities. It's just the, 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 the best way to go out and experience our communities at the end of the day is to go out and have a good meal. It's been tough. It has been tough, and, and that is a good way to go out and experience these individual municipalities and towns all throughout southeastern Michigan and all across the state. So uh, definitely from a recreation standpoint, from an exploratory standpoint for people who are traveling I want to travel close to home. It do, it does take a take an element of that away. All right, I think we're gonna have a minute here to check with Erica Jones, so uh, we'll check in with her. Our Erica Jones is uh, out and about right now. In uh, I think she's near our studio, so she's in West Bloomfield at a grocery store just to find out how it's going. I think she's got her gloves and her mask, and uh, she's all geared up. We'll take a quick break, and we'll be right back, and we'll check in with Erica and see uh, what what's happening on the front lines of the coronavirus when we return. Hi, I'm Dr. Jonay Caldoun. We know that COVID-19 is spreading rapidly across Michigan right now. The most important thing people can do to protect themselves is social distancing. That means unless you are a critical infrastructure worker or going out to get food or medicine for your home, you should be staying at home. Stay home, stay safe, save lives. Hi, I'm Oakland County Executive Dave Coulter. Our top priority remains slowing the spread of COVID-19 in our communities. Please stay home, and when you must go out to an essential business, take precautions like social distancing and washing your hands when you come home. Because of the pandemic, we are behind in our response rate in Michigan. While you are home, please take a few minutes to fill out the census. It is more important than ever that we receive money back from our federal government. The census is Oakland together. Welcome back to the mega cast all across Oakland County. Dave Scott here. I've got to keep my social distancing. Tyler over there on the other side of the studio. Yeah. Over there on your side of the studio? I'm on my side. I'm right, staying. I'm not good. crossing the wall. Stay in your own side of the studio. Erica Six Jones, feet. we can see her. Look at her. She is all masked up and out at one of our grocery stores. We'll check in with her in just a couple of minutes. You are listening to the mega cast on 89.3 Lakes FM, 88.1 WBFH, The Biff, WAHS 89.5 Avondale Community Radio. Bernie Birmingham Municipal Access Television, Civic Center TV in the West Bloomfield area. And uh, thanks for watching today on the West Bloomfield Fire Department's Facebook page and on CivicCenterTV.com. So, Tyler, it's been almost two months now. We primarily, in fact, we've been exclusively here in our studio talking about everything that's going on in the real world. Finally, with the help of our good friend Erica Jones, we are going to open up our horizon here a little bit and step outside so uh, let's do so right now joining us from uh, some grocery store in the area is civic center tv's erica jones hi erica hi you're doing good we can hear you but i'm smiling i we, we <laughs> i told her you know she's new media person i said erica when we come to you 
at the beginning of your, your stand-up, you got to be smiling. That's what all reporters do. And uh, so she's making sure that we know. We know you're smiling, Eric. It's okay. Can you, you do, see it in my eyes? I can see it in your eyes. Yes. We, we know you're yes, doing the can. right thing. you got your mask on. Um, so we wanted to find out what it's like out there in the real world. You're at a grocery store in our area. Uh, just tell us what you're seeing and experiencing. So I am at Kroger right now, and it's pretty empty here, actually. I haven't been to the grocery store in a few weeks, and last time I was here, there were definitely way more people here. So I don't know if it's just early in the day or people are following restrictions more, but definitely not a lot of people here, making it easy for social distancing. And every person I've seen has on a mask, so that's great. Yeah, I think that's a, sure. I, I've been I've been experiencing the same thing. We're seeing Tyler that people are observing the guidelines of the governor, regardless of all the politics and everything going on. People are doing what they're they've been asked to do. They are, and, and it's I've I've seen it all over. I've seen it. I've been to the Kroger in West Bloomfield. I've been to other grocery stores near where I live for. Ver- for at various times and generally i'm seeing people wearing their masks i'm seeing people following those social distancing guidelines like the uh line rules before the checkout and the uh, arrows in the in the aisles so that we would never get away with this eric i'm putting you back on screen we'd never get away with this this is the kroger people didn't invite us in but you know we have every right to walk in there and go cover this stuff so uh, did they don't know? Did they know you're a member of the media, or they just think you're some crazy college kid with a with a phone and a mask on? Um, I'm thinking the second option. I'm definitely getting some weird stares, but <laughs> do what you got to do. Yeah, you're doing great. Thank you. Keep it up. So I'm curious, Tyler. I'm kind of curious. We've heard a lot of reports that uh, that the the availability of meat has been reduced a little bit. Erica, can you like work your way over to the meat department? Yeah. Let's just go see. This is like firsthand live reality television here. Let's go see if they have meat. We're we're on Meat Watch now. (laughs) Well, but all seriousness, I noticed last night when I went to my store, there was very, the meat supplies are way down. I mean, we started out not having any toilet paper, and and I could see some of the shelves behind it. A lot of them are stocked up pretty well, but... uh, but some of them, you know, are uh, not quite as full. And this is certainly no indictment of the store that she's no. in because, you know, that the Kroger chain's been doing an absolutely amazing job. There we go. Thanks. Good shot, Erica. I could see what's can going see on. Very few people. Yeah, I could see very few people. And I can see that, uh, Tyler, like what we've been experiencing, the shelves are stocked pretty well. So you're in the meat department now, right? Yeah, I mean, it actually seems like. They have a lot of stuff. Stocked pretty well. I wouldn't notice there's anything scarce. All right. Um, well, thank you. This is, in all of my years of broadcasting, this is the first live report we've done on the status of meat in a grocery store. But I guess, me, it's, it's, I guess it's timely, right? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you know, with manufacturing in Michigan just coming back and plants throughout the state, uh, throughout the state and throughout the country and, and other industries as well, Having some impact from social distancing and from stay-at-home orders, it's not surprising that we're seeing a slight meat shortage throughout the country uh, start to amount, but it's good to know that our local stores also are well in stock. So, uh, Erica, do you think people are social? I see no one's getting really close to you. Do you think they're social distancing from you because they're just trying to keep six feet away, or do they think you're just, like, talking to your phone and they are worried and scared of you? You know, they might just think I'm trying to take selfies or something and they're <laughs> staying out of them. I don't think it's very clear what's going on, but I don't think people are social distancing from me specifically. Everyone seems to be staying pretty far away from people who don't have headphones on. So All right. I don't know if they think I'm special. No, you're doing a great job. Anything else you want to share? Any other observations? Anything that uh, we should know from the front line of the coronavirus today at a at an area grocery store? I mean, I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing. I really think, like I said, people are being much more observant of the guidelines because there are very few people here, and the here has on a mask. And, 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 so I'm very pleasantly surprised with what we have. All right, we're having a little trouble hearing you now, but uh, 
Thank you. Great first report, and uh, this will be uh, the first of many. We look forward to you uh, actually getting out, talking to some people, which I'm sure other people will talk to you a little difficult when you people right now i think erica they want to get in the store take care of their business go home wash their hands and clean up i don't think people are really excited about spending a lot of time in the store yeah i would agree with that everyone seems pretty unapproachable so Um, just walking by and staring at me a little bit (laughs) okay all right well if you see her if you see uh erica jones out around uh, oakland county with her mask or gloves and her phone and she's looks like she's taking a selfie don't run away she just wants to talk to you on civic center tv all right thank you erica great job great first report we really appreciate it well there you go she's gonna do fine yeah that that was her that was her screen test she did she did fantastic did fantastic <laughs> all right successful me watch. all right let's take a quick break we'll be back in a couple of minutes we are are going to uh, take a look at the news headlines. I want you to hear the quote from the governor from yesterday's press conference talking about uh, some of the things coming up here uh, with regard to protests and social distancing in the state of Michigan. We're going to quickly check in with Greg Flynn from the West Bloomfield Township Fire Department and talk to uh, a uh, person from the uh, tutor doctor and find out how um, tutoring is going and how our students are doing and, and talking about a little bit of uh, extra help for your students at home. We'll be right back. This is the Megacast. The Centers for Disease Control in Oakland County Health Division encourages households to prepare for the possibility of a coronavirus outbreak in their community. Keep extra items in your house for an extended stay at home. Remember any special food items for babies, the elderly, and pets. Keep non-prescription drugs and other health supplies on hand, such as personal medications, at least one month supply, first aid kits, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, at least 60% alcohol, non-mercury thermometer, and get copies and maintain electronic versions of health records. Talk with family members about how they would be cared for if they got sick and what would be needed to care for them in your home. Learn about the plan at your child's school and your workplace. Discuss sick leave policies and or telework options for workers who become ill. For more information, go to oakgov.com forward slash health or call our nurse on call hotline at 1-800-848-5533. Coronavirus is deadly, but Michigan can fight back. Our front doors are the front lines of defense. Staying home is the best way to stop the spread because just one infected person can give it to 40 who can give it to countless more. So call grandma, don't visit, video chat, don't meet up. And if you must go out for food or medicine, keep at least six feet from others. Stay home, stay safe, stop the spread. Hi, my name is Kurt Lawson and I'm the public information officer for West Bloomfield Township. We wanted to reach out to you, our older adults, to provide information that you may find useful during this difficult time. We want to ensure you that West Bloomfield Town Hall, our Waters and Utility Department, West Bloomfield Parks, and our Police and Fire Departments continue to work hard on your behalf. Information and resources can be found on the Township website, the Police Facebook and Twitter, or call West Bloomfield Parks COVID-19 Help Hotline. Please remember to keep your social distance of at least six feet, wear facial coverings when you leave your home, and wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap. These precautions will help keep you safe during these difficult times. So, Tyler, you better watch out for your job. That Erica Jones, she's doing an amazing job. I'm definitely afraid. I really am. <laughs> she's doing an amazing she job. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, we always enjoy having our summer interns and skilled college students joining us here on the megacast be great to have eric jones back this summer 89.3 lakes fm 88.1 wbfh the biff wahs 89.5 avondale community radio birmingham area municipal access in birmingham bingham farms beverly hills and franklin civic center tv in west bloomfield orchard lake kingo harbor 
Cape Sill and Lake and beyond. Watch us on CivicCenterTV.com. And today on the West Bloomfield Fire Department Facebook page, we'll check in with the fire chief out there in West Bloomfield in a couple of minutes, Greg Flynn. We are uh, trying to get a hold right now of the folks at the Tudor Doctor that have locations around our area, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to connect with them in a couple of minutes. Wow. Yesterday, Governor's press conference, you saw it live, right? I did yeah, not. Yes, we okay. live. So, uh, Governor didn't break a whole lot of news yesterday, uh, but she wasn't really too shy about her feelings, in particular about the protests that have been happening in Lansing. Governor Whitmer. I'm concerned about the safety of people who continue to demonstrate and congregate without wearing masks and without best practices. And I'm increasingly concerned about the violent nature of the extreme comments that are being made around these organizations and groups that are coming together. The violent, racist, extreme rhetoric that has already been connected to Thursday's rally and that was reported in the Metro Times today I think is um, concerning isn't a strong enough word. And yet, this could be avoided if Republican leadership in the legislature would step up and denounce that kind of activity. If there was anyone on the other side of the aisle that would do that. People can have any opinion they want, but to threaten someone else is beyond the pale. And it is not right, and it is contrary to the principles that have founded this great country of ours. You can you can always tell when she's a little teed off, Tyler. That, and I don't mean to make light of it. I'm not. You know, I she's she's done an amazing job dealing with all this, and let's. Uh, uh, you know, I just want to say that, but <laughs> you can always tell when she's a little frustrated. She starts tapping on the podium, right? And she did that yesterday. She was clearly mad yesterday that she's having to deal with personal threats. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, all of us here in Michigan uh, get a little bit of a black eye when these protests happen in Lansing because they make the national news or CNN and, and Fox and MSNBC and all the television networks. So, uh, you know, get, get braced. We're, we're we're going to have another one of those on Thursday. And uh, in the interest of being totally fair, there's a lot of people that have a reasonable uh, reason for beef. And as Marty Nolenberg said a couple of minutes ago, you can look at what the governor has done and say, well, her orders have not necessarily been fair. They've been somewhat arbitrary. You can look at the other side and say, well, how the heck do you pick certain parts of the economy to open and not open other parts of the economy? And do that in a fair way. And that's what she's trying to do. I think what she's trying to do is say, we're going to open this. So right now it's manufacturing. So manufacturing is the winner and restaurants are the loser, right? Yeah. But we're going to open manufacturing and see how it goes for a couple of weeks, right? And then if that goes good, then we're going to open something else. And we're going to open something else. He couldn't have opened up everything at the same time yeah. and implemented the strategy. And to be somewhat fair to the Republicans here, based on her comment, you know, that they haven't, I don't know that they've gone out, I don't want to get in the middle of this, but I don't know that they've necessarily gone out and, you know, uh, egged on the protesters. I think depending on your political persuasion, you might have an opinion on that one way or the other. And, and, and in fact, I thought it was kind of cool that the folks that filed that lawsuit in Lansing said, hey, wait a minute. Follow the rules. We're filing the lawsuit. We don't really like We have a difference of opinion, a legitimate difference of opinion. But the, the rules that the governor has in place, follow them. Now, if you're a barber in Owasso, you're saying heck with that. I, I'm going to take my own political stand. So there's all these little things going on all over the place. And we're not to offer any opinion on any of them, but we're just here to highlight them and bring them to your attention. And I thought that if you're just trying to get the temperature of all this, that comment from the governor uh, was very revealing. Absolutely, it, it, it was. And there's a lot of tension in Lansing between the legislature and between the governor and between people that are on the other sides of the aisle that, that may not agree with the governor's actions during this time or with her political party. But I do think at the same time, this goes with w whether you're a Democrat to a Republican or Republican to a Democrat. You're, they're not the leadership in those parties are not asking or not encouraging any sort of violence or any sort of 
antisocial sort of behavior like death threats against people of the other party. You can disagree with someone and still hope for the best. For yeah, them. and I would agree with you. And I, I've not seen that either. But, you know, maybe we're not seeing the whole thing. We're not up in Lansing. And she's, you know, it's difficult. It's it's difficult when it's your phone where the phone is ringing and someone's saying something and hanging up. It's difficult when you're getting that email. She's a relatively new governor. She's, you know, and, and I guess if she's going to be a potentially a VP candidate, then, uh, you know, it's like you throw yourself out there. You're going to get some of that stuff. But uh, none of us like and it isn't right that people yeah. have been making death threats. And in this case, Tyler, I mean, people have been signing them. It's it's really been pretty mm -hmm. dramatic. OK, thank goodness we can move on and get back to what we like to do here. And that is talking about the things that that impact you each and every day right here in your own hometown and uh, making your kids, uh, you know, helping them get the education they need is uh, probably the most important thing to many people listening and watching right now, parents around uh, Oakland County. And uh, one of the folks that's here to give you a helping hand because many of you, you know, you're, you've been just thrust right into being a teacher in your own home with education going virtual. And, you know, it was okay while we were all at home, but now more and more of us are going back to work. So uh, you might need a helping hand. And here's one person that is here to help you. It is Carol as Zorovitz, I'll get that right. The owner of Tudor Doctor. I'm sure I butchered your last name, Carol. Help me out here. Okay. It actually got close. So it's a fine. All right. Carol is the owner of Tudor Doctor. Hi, Carol. How you doing? Welcome to the Megacast. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thanks for joining us. So, what, A, what is a Tudor Doctor? What do you guys do? Well, Tutor Doctor is an international tutoring company. Uh, we've been around since 2003, and we are in 15 countries right now and quickly growing. Uh, it is a franchise tutoring organization, and I own Tutor Doctor Orion Bloomfield, which is all the area of Lake Orion down to Southfield and Rochester over to West Bloomfield. Uh, I have a friend who owns Tutor Doctor over in Troy and part of Rochester as well. And what we do is we specialize in one-to-one -one in home tutoring. Uh, we go shoulder to shoulder with our students. We hand match our tutors and our students to get the best possible win. And now under this whole new COVID-19 quarantine, we are 100% virtual. So we are still delivering our top-notch one-to-one tutoring. We're just all doing it through a secured, a secured classroom now. Carol Azarevitz is joining us. She is the owner of Tutor Doctor. Glad to hear, Carol, that uh, you are covering uh, much the same geography that we are. So you're talking to parents. What are they telling you, Carol, about uh, this new year? I think most parents, even though the good parents that they are, are involved in their kids. None of them have been involved as much as they have been lately. How's that going for parents? What kind of observations do you have for us? Uh, our parents are doing very well. I am myself a parent of three teenagers, so I'm right there in the mix with them. Uh, you know, when the quarantine first started mid-March, we were all, we can do this, this is three or four weeks, we've got this. Now that we're in week, I don't know, it feels like 1,526. But uh, it's, it's, been, eight, it's been at least a couple of months, go ahead. Yes, uh, we're starting to see parents as well as students, their mental well-being is kind of getting a little shaky. Uh, the everybody's still trying their hardest and it's a very difficult time. So quarantine is wearing on everyone very thin. Uh, I speak as for three kids, it is hard. It's hard to work. It is hard to keep track of all the different platforms that my teenagers are on. I'm seeing this with a lot of parents. They call me, they're worried about their children's well-being. You know, we've been in contact with the incredible people over at the West Bloomfield community coalition as well. Uh, people are doing everything they can. So it's very hard right now for everyone, uh, including I'm sure you and me and you know, people are doing everything they, they can are. Just to they're they're doing. I think people, by and large, I would agree with you. They're doing a good job in all right. aspects of their life. We we're just at the grocery store, and everyone's got their mask on, and you know, we're all right. trying. Carol Azarevitz, owner of Tudor Doctor, around uh, our our area. 
Carol, you know, obviously one thing people could do is they can call you and get a little help, and I'm sure that's happening. Yes. And but but if parents just if you can give them like two or three tips, they're they're Absolutely. struggling right now at their home. Can you give us a couple of things that they can do to help their students do better? And, and we do this on the phone all the time with parents. Absolutely. So do your best to stay on top of subjects. On Sunday night. We go through the list. Uh, we start getting emails from all the teachers Sunday. It could be into Monday morning. We start to organize because I have three teenagers and I'm on calls and they're on calls. So we have like, this is a, an example of our weekly planner. This is just for webinars and classroom calls. So we can keep track of who needs a device and when and make sure all the devices are charged and that people have a quiet space. Uh, it's a lot of pre-planning. So yesterday, my junior had his AP government exam through the college board, and we had to go through all the protocol to make sure that he was uh, well established to take that exam. So maintaining some type of a routine and a schedule is so important. Uh, as we see people's mental well-being starting to shake a little bit, having simple routines is so important for adults and kids, whether it's getting up and making your bed freshening up, you know, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, getting breakfast, having a routine that you follow every day, not a structured eight hour routine. I'm saying like maybe three or four things that the kids can do for themselves, age appropriate. It helps them just keep into a rhythm and that helps mental their mental stability so much carol they i think good good really good general advice too i mean it just that that just helps even beyond education i i i personally now, don't go ahead oh okay i was gonna say uh learning takes place more than just in their school subjects we don't expect students to really study as they would in school for eight hours straight that's just not very realistic they're at home. They have a lot more distractions. We have pets here. People have other siblings and so forth. We say, you know, take breaks, take brain breaks. So you can do your learning in other ways. Uh, we go geocaching. That's a science thing. You could bake in the kitchen. That's math and it's a chemistry experiment. Playing board games together. The kids are the banker or the loan officer in, let's say, payday. That's math. There are tons of different ways that you can reach out to your kids that are in a non-traditional learning way that they're still learning. I love it. In, in, in my house, in my house, in my house, uh, the uh, the activities in the kitchen, they have all the things that you talked about. And we add in a dose of fire protection as well, and uh, and and that goes <laughs> that goes a long way too. No, I like what you're saying. I mean, to get you know, right. just as you're going through your normal activities, all of those are educational touch points exactly. now i don't have any kids so this isn't for me but i imagine a parents uh what kids are learning in school right now is very different than what we learn should they should parents be intimidated by some of the programs and if they can't specifically answer a question of their student because that can be a little intimidating i uh, it can be because we're re we're admitting that we are human and we don't know um, and no, the teachers are all there. They're, our teachers are working so hard right now in every school district. They are answering emails as fast as they can. They're hosting calls in online classroom platforms. Uh, reach out to your teachers. If you have any questions, if you're worried about is your student submitting the information correctly in the right format, are they all caught up? If they need help, the teachers are there. Now, as for Tutor Doctor, we're also here and we have created a whole new learning package that's outside of traditional tutoring as one would normally assume tutoring we have at home school support packages so we have students right now that log on for 30 minutes a day five days a week with their tutor and it's a check-in it gives the parents a break that are working from home and it's very hard to be an employee and a parent and a teacher and an you know and an administrator so we can come into your home via a secured platform and meet with your student for 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and give the parents that ability to be a parent and not the education ability partner.
No, I like that. It's a really it's it's really good idea, and it's got to be helpful. And for those folks that uh, can work that into their plan, uh, why not? It makes all kinds of sense. What do you think is right. going to happen this summer, Carol? As uh, the uh, traditional school calendar <laughs> ends, and you know, do, do, do you look at your crystal ball and and see what parents might want to do uh, as we head into the summertime? Well, we always say even in a traditional school year, the summer slide is very real. So we like to keep tutoring going throughout the summer because even when the kids are in school, traditional school, till June, they're still out for two and a half months and they lose so much. So we like to keep the tutoring going. What's going to happen on the educational landscape is kind of unknown right now. And we're keeping a close eye on what is happening here in Michigan. We're keeping an eye on what is happening in other states. And right now we don't really know exactly what September is going to look like. We do encourage, there's going to be a lot of kids that have lost a lot of foundations just because of the home learning, not that our parents are not trying, they are, but we do have kids that are going to learn their found, lose their foundations over the summer and because of quarantine. So again, the our learning packages will stay in effect until traditional schools come mm-hmm. back in session. Carol, I appreciate you taking time, and uh, good to know about the tutor doctor being available in our area. Um, where can people go uh, online to get your information? Well, we have two avenues. Um, so first, we have a Facebook group that is a support group. It's an at-home learning support group, and you just have to sign on to be a member and we're putting all sorts of resources and encouragement out there and we encourage our parents to talk to us our tutors are out there talking as well and it allows parents to know that they're not alone if they're feeling like they're alone they're not we are all in the same boat if all right so you've got for, forgive me care we got to zip along you've got oh, facebook okay. and do you have a you have a website as well we do um okay. so the facebook group is if they look at tdob at home learning and then find our Facebook group that way. And if they want to learn more about Tutor Doctor and our great packages that we can help you with, it is tutordoctor.com backslash Orion dash Bloomfield. All right, Carol, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being on. It's just the reality of our show. It's We never have enough time, okay. but it's good. I really, <laughs> right. really, really appreciate your information. Good to have you with us today. And uh, we're going to do all we can, mom and dads, to help you help your kids make it a successful time at school. We're going to be right back. We're going to check in with our good friend Greg Flynn uh, as we go back to West Bloomfield and check in with the West Bloomfield Fire Department. He always has information that is really helpful to folks across all of our communities. So stay tuned. Greg Flynn next on the MegaCast. Hello, I'm Dr. Betty Chu, Chief Quality Officer at Henry Ford Health System, and I'm with Wright Lassiter, Henry Ford Health System's CEO, to talk about coronavirus. In uncertain times, it's natural to have questions. So I'm going to ask Dr. Chu to answer some of the common ones. First, why can't I visit my grandma to see if she's okay? Because the elderly are at a higher risk for complications with this disease, and you could inadvertently infect her. If I'm healthy, why can't I go out with my friends? The larger the crowd you're exposed to, the higher the chance you could get infected and infect others. If I have symptoms, why do I have to seek care? While the disease isn't dangerous for most people, for others, it can be. We need to understand how serious your case is, because the right choices save lives. For more information, visit henryford.com or call 313-874-1055. Hello, I'm Dr. Faust, Medical Director for the Oakland County Health Division. Coronavirus Disease 2019, or COVID-19, is a new disease caused by a new respiratory virus named SARS-CoV-2. COVID-19 was first identified in December 2019. There is currently no vaccine to prevent coronavirus disease 2019. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to this virus. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, especially after going to the bathroom, before eating, and after blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects and surfaces using a regular household cleaning spray or wipe. Avoid close contact with people who are sick and avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Cover your cough or sneeze with a tissue, then throw the tissue in the trash. Finally, 
Stay home when you're sick. For more information about coronavirus disease 2019, go to okgov.com slash health or call 1-800-848-5533. Why do I always want to wash my hands before I talk to Greg Flynn at the police department or the fire department? <laughs> it's like it's like he was the guy who first told me when we started this whole thing almost two months ago, Dave, you gotta wash your hands. Like and then you gotta sing the, the happy birthday song. You gotta do that twice and do all the things you gotta do. Our studio is perfectly clean. We wiped everything down just a couple of moments ago. We've been washing our hands like crazy, keeping our social distancing. Wearing the masks here at the office as soon as we get off the air and are walking around in close proximity. I think, let's see, masks, hand washing, cleaning the surfaces, social distancing. What did I miss, Greg Flynn? Did I get all of them? I know it sounds like a hand, shoulders, knees, and toes song you got going on there, Dave. <laughs> he is the chief of the West Bloomfield Fire Department and uh, joining us from uh, Fire Station Number Five. It looks like to me. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Chief. How's everything going with our first responders in Oakland County today? Well, good afternoon. Well, almost afternoon. Uh, it's good to be with you again, Dave. Uh, it's such a a great, great work that your team's doing with the Megacast, uh, and it's always a, a pleasure to be part of that. Uh, as you can see over my shoulder, uh, we're starting to find ways of uh, getting, you know, back to uh, our, our routine here at the fire department. You're going to hear some bottles clang. We got some uh, knot training, rope training that's going on uh, behind me here. Uh, but w things are uh, returning back to some uh, standard levels as far as call volumes go. I think uh, folks are feeling more comfortable uh, dealing with uh, the things you see. I'm, I'm wearing my mask today, and you may see some of the uh, firefighters walk behind me wearing masks. You know, we're getting more comfortable with doing that as part of our, our everyday uh, inner workings with one another, especially, we underscore, especially when we're not able to observe the six-foot social distancing. Well, I appreciate that, and that's uh, that's essential. And now businesses are beginning to open in our area, manufacturing beginning to open this week, and we'll have more of that, and different sectors of the economy are opening, so uh, uh, people are getting out of their homes more, and so it's really important that these things that you should have been doing anyway, but um, as you start to get out in, uh, in, exposed, in a more exposed environment, that you're doing all the things that we just – talked about and, and implementing that i talked to help me out here and we didn't talk before we went on the air but i talked to dave coulter our county executive a couple of days ago on the show and he uh, mentioned briefly um, a program that some of the fire departments in oakland county and yours in particular are helping the county with i think it had to do with transporting uh some patients maybe at nursing homes are you familiar with what he was talking about well, what I think the county executive might have been referring to is the need that the state uh, emergency operations center identified that our long-term care facilities, our, um, our senior uh, apartment complexes, were target areas that we saw that the coronavirus was spreading rapidly. So what we wanted to do was get in there and mitigate that with testing. The struggle the county was having was, as the state was allocating tests, what the county needed was staff to administer those tests. So we partnered, uh, I think ourselves, uh, our colleagues down in Southfield, I think Birmingham, our friends in Farmington Hills, uh, the medics, a uh, small group of paramedics of each group took specialized training. And then we went into facilities that we're familiar with. We're in and out of these facilities every day, Dave. And so we're familiar with the staff, we're familiar with the residents, the floor plan, and we went in with the county health and uh, we were able to test hundreds of residents. And I believe we have another one scheduled even for uh, later on this week to go in and, and do hundreds more uh, tests right here in West Bloomfield. You know, and that that's a beautiful story, Greg Flynn, the uh, chief of the West Bloomfield Township uh, and Tri-City Fire Department. Um, so thank you for clarifying what uh, the county executive was talking about. We had a really brief conversation about that. I didn't completely understand. But, you know, that's that's a great example. There was a need. There was a fit. And it, you were able to help out with your part. County helped out with their part. We, you guys all worked together. And I know those kind of communications are going on every day. Uh, I imagine you're still having all those conference calls with 
fire departments and other agencies that you're interacting with on a daily basis to figure out how to solve problems just like that one. We have, and those, while we've refined those down to uh, some strategic times throughout the week, uh, everybody is starting to find the efficiencies that we have to get the job done. And so some of those calls aren't as necessary as they were mm-hmm. weeks ago. You know, we're, I think our math show is week nine. Um, and so it's, it's, we're nine weeks. I would hope with uh, that uh, we could start to master some of this. Um, and, and I think we have, uh, we've done a, a really the staff, I say, we, I, I put myself in there, but really it's not me. Um, it's the folks that you see walking behind me in the shot here every so often. They're the, they truly are on the front line and they're the ones that make it happen. Well, there has been tremendous progress and certainly, uh, we should uh, take time to, to note that. And yeah, it's been uh, nine weeks since we did started this show and really this, uh, began, uh, this, uh, pandemic began to rear its ugly head here in Oakland County and in West Bloomfield. Today though, we wake up and read the news and, uh, my notes say 16 new cases, in Oakland County, and I mean that we would we, we still have the coronavirus here, but that is a great sign that the folks in the county are doing everything that they can to mitigate the spread. Your thoughts, Greg Flynn? Well, my thoughts are that here we are nine weeks into something that we've really never had to deal with before, and we're already seeing those numbers come down. So. Um, Again, I'm not uh, throwing a victory flag out there yet. What I'm recognizing, and I think we need to acknowledge, is the swift action that uh, our state and local governments, our county government, ha- what they've done. And the, the people from the folks working at the, uh, um, in the labs to the folks that are uh, putting uh, work engineering controls in our uh, grocery stores and the, the one-way aisles and, and dedicated shopping time for at-risk populations. Everybody contributed to this. We sometimes focus a, a little bit selfishly here on, on that public safety response from police and fire, but there are so many people that have stepped into uh, solutions on the on the side of the of, of fighting this pandemic that, uh, that again, you've talked to, you've, you hear me that theme of celebrating that and I think we need to, and you highlight that so often with this lineup of guests that you bring on that are addressing all of these different uh, ways of looking at the pandemic, the different lenses we look through. And clearly my lens is more of an emergency preparedness thing, but you get the educational component with the school district and you're getting the mental health component with counselors that you have on the show. It really is a comprehensive look at the pandemic. Well, that's kind of you to say, and you know, we've been seeing finally some media outlets starting to pop up that are, are, are there specifically to provide positive news. And we're just trying to tell the story from the front line. But as we start to tell the story and talk to people, there is a tremendous amount of positive news. And yes, we have, you know, bar- Barber shops in Owasso and protests in Lansing that are making news and captivating most of what you see at 6 and 11. But the, the reality of what you just said, Greg Flynn, is apparent. And you have to be totally blind and deaf not to see the amazing progress that we have made. And it hasn't been easy. And, and let's be honest, COVID-19, it's still there. It's still ugly. It, the disease hasn't changed. Okay, you know, we've changed. We've changed our behaviors, and all those people have done an amazing thing. And I really enjoy talking to you because, you you know, we were there right at the very beginning, and you've really helped us Mm -hmm. identify and get through these things. So big focus now, and we can pat ourselves on the back. That's good. But the big focus now is getting businesses open. And we talked to a restaurateur earlier in the show. They're not open yet. That's really hurting their business. They can't open. There are other sectors of the economy that aren't open. So as manufacturing opens, which I know isn't a big factor in your service area, but as other um, areas of business begin to open up, it's important that we do all the right things so we don't see a spike in any way whatsoever and we can keep opening up this economy. Um, you know, it's again, I just want to remind everybody of that and I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that again and and uh, anything you want to share in in that area. So if you were to go back and play some of our initial or or that first interview, and I I think it was in the the first interview or the second time that we were on uh, uh, this coronavirus special update, right? Um, 
I was trying to underscore the need that knowledge is power, right? And that a well-informed community is a resilient community and a community that is ready to respond. That's what we've accomplished with the different venues. Uh, you know, you, I, you know, you have Deputy Chief Lawson on our public information officer sharing the messages that are coming out of the Emergency Operations Center. Again, the the uh, the list of uh, guests that you have on the show. What I'm getting at, though, Dave, is all of that is is specifically tailored to informing the public. I, I was listening to the national news this morning at breakfast. Uh -huh. And one of the commentators said, you know, people aren't safe. And I need to know what is it that people need to know so that they, <laughs> they can be safe. And it's almost like we're dictating that they're not safe. We're saying you're not safe. And what this has done, what these our conversations have said is, here's how to be safe. Here's how you can be knowledgeable. And nine weeks in, now I don't want <laughs> to, I'm not superstitious, but nine weeks in, working in the emergency operations center, working around people taking care of sick patients, a workforce that is in treating patients in their homes sick, positive for COVID-19, and our count remains at three. All three of those individuals that got sick at the WBFD were all tip of the spear, all early in March. It, workers need to know you can do it. You can do it, but we have to get over this stigma right here that this is okay and I can have a conversation with you. We have to understand that 20 seconds is 20 seconds of aggressive hand washing. And we need to know that we don't want you doing this. So, and that it's okay when I meet somebody new that I say, hello, yeah, good to meet you. And I don't need to go out with a handshake. Those things are easy to overcome with that knowledge. And that's what we're doing. And so we celebrate that success. And I, as I know the team at, at, at Town Hall is gonna be bringing back our our staff there and the message to them needs to be it is safe and you control that part of your safety and we're responsible to one another i'll tell you the message we want to leave with today though is this one here dave not acceptable i think we need to we need to diagnose this as like um fc mp facial covering misplacement okay <laughs> this is hold on wait wait anybody. hang on hold on we have to add that to the COVID 19 vocabulary yeah, tyler I, oh, one more yeah. time what go. was that facial covering displacement or misplacement yeah however we want to acronym that you know <laughs> i like facial the covering misplacement fcm i'm just yeah. making sure that yeah. <laughs> anything that starts with an f you've got to be very careful over the rest of the <laughs> now. Oh, okay man. so facial covering misplacement i like it greg hey listen we got to yeah. go thank you very much we'll do this again excellent advice Sounds good perfect story thank you so much for sharing that story that your department three people got sick in your department and you are absolutely the tip of the sword and it happened in the very beginning of it we can do it one final question uh, are we keeping an eye on things? Because as we open things up, we certainly don't want it to go the wrong way. Can you just assure us that as somebody somewhere, the county, the township, the state, the federal government, or all of you guys are keeping an eye on things every day to make sure that if, if we run into another problem, that we're able to address it as quickly as possible? The answer to that is a, a firm yes. We're well aware of what can happen with a rebound or a, 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 another outbreak of this. But just please keep in mind, we can provide the path. We can provide the resources, but it's the responsibility of each individual within our community to embrace that and to take the self-responsibility that it is within a community to stop the spread of COVID-19. All right, Tyler, would you cut that down and then send it over to Greg so he can put it on his Facebook channel? We put it on every Facebook channel we have. Well said, Chief Flynn. Thank you for joining us today. Double thumbs up Enjoyed from our, our chief. Facial covering misplacement, Tyler. Add that to our COVID-19 vocabulary. Oh, yeah. We only got, we got time. Do you think we can rip through the vocabulary? Uh, you know, and, I think we could try. Okay, let's do it really quick. <laughs> Flatten the curve. I just a concerted effort by the community to do whatever they can to make sure we're not we're not encouraging an exponential spread of the physical virus. distancing, keeping a safe distance of at least six feet away from other people so you're not spreading the virus. All right, the happy birthday song. Uh, sing that twice over as you wash your hands for a thorough washing. And and Flynn just did a great job oh, yes. showing you how to wash your hands. Asymptomatic. 
If you may be carrying the disease or someone else may be carrying the disease but not showing physical symptoms. Pandemic. That is a worldwide spread of a disease or virus. When we say we're doing this in an abundance of caution. Taking extra precautions to make sure you're not picking up or spreading the virus. What is it? PPE? As personal protective equipment. Oh, yeah. Here's one, people. It's not on everyone's radar. Uh, Coronavirus pandemic dreams. There's a weird dreams you're having due to over or under stimulus during the pandemic. The non-dominant hand, another real good one to remind people about. Yep, It's a fan favorite. It's whatever hand you usually write with or throw a ball with or whatever. The hand you use most often is your dominant hand. The non-dominant hand is your other hand. You should use that for opening doors. And And my mask-wearing friends, do not find yourself in the ultimate faux pas, the coronavirus period, Uh, having a facial covering misplacement. That is wrongfully aligning your facial covering so that it's rendered ineffective if it's not over your nose your mouth and your chin it allows for some air particles to escape that could put you and others in danger yeah i mean it's tempting too because you know so your, your glasses tend to fog up I, we have a tip for that we'll share that tomorrow uh-huh. on the show i can tell you real quick just wash your glasses in warm water and i'm told that they will not fog up okay because that that's the reason why it just gets irritating if you're wearing glasses like i do to uh to be able to deal with that hey we got that in in about a minute and a half we we do those points for you every day just to remind you the things that you need to do thanks to uh, greg Flynn, thanks to Carol at uh, the Tudor Doctor, Marty Nolenberg for joining us earlier today. My uh, good friend Lee Stanley, FAA guy extraordinaire, talking about uh, the planes and the uh, and the Blue Angels today, which hopefully you saw. Eric Pierce, thank you for joining us, and Sandra Henriquez joining us from the Detroit Housing Commission. Uh, good to talk to you as well. Uh, be healthy, be safe, take care of yourself, and we'll see you here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning as we continue with our daily broadcast, keeping an eye on COVID-19. This is the Megacast, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.